So last week we finished our series, With Whom We War, and we're going to do a couple of kind of standalone messages today. And I have something that is kind of near and dear to my heart, something that's near and dear to my family, something I'd like to talk about today. And that's this belief that we have that if you do good things, then good things happen, right? It's kind of this, this common belief we all have. But anyone who's lived a little while in this world, on this planet, knows that that is absolutely not true. It's absolutely not true. And it's this thought that comes from kind of the Eastern, Eastern religions, this, this idea of karma, right? Whatever you put out into the world, whatever you give is what you get back. However, even those who are believers in this type of thinking understand that bad things happen to good people sometimes, and they have to explain that. And the way that they explain that is to say, well, if you're doing good things and you're getting back bad things, that's because in a former life you were bad and now you're receiving what you did in that former life. Now, of course, we don't believe in reincarnation, so we have to have another explanation for why bad things happen to good people. While if, why, if you do good, not necessarily good is going to come back to you. There was a man named Frederick Tucker, and he was born in 1853. He was born in India. And he went to school in Britain. And in 1875, an evangelist came to Britain. And you might recognize the evangelist. His name was D.L. Moody. He came, and he, Tucker, Frederick Tucker, heard D.L. Moody preach. And he was saved. So Tucker eventually got married. And his life was one full of one tragedy after another. He got married, and eventually his wife died of cholera. And so a year or two later, he met a woman named Emma, Emma Booth, and he married Emma Booth. Emma was the daughter of William and Catherine Booth. And if you recognize that name, that's because they are the founders of the Salvation Army. So eventually, Emma and Tucker, Frederick Tucker, became the leaders over the American Salvation Army. So one day, Tucker is here in America, and he's preaching in a church in Chicago, and he's sharing about the love of Christ. He's sharing about Jesus. He's sharing his heart with these people. When all of a sudden, up from the crowd, large crowd, comes a man, and he speaks so everyone can hear. And this is what he says to Tucker. He says, you can talk like that about how Christ is dear to you and helps you, but if your wife was dead, as my wife is, and if you had some babies crying for their mother who would never return, never come back, you could not say what you are saying right now. And he left. Well, tragically, what happened not long after this, Tucker's wife died in a train wreck. And as her body was being brought back to, brought back to Chicago, the funeral was held there at the Salvation Army barracks. Huge crowd. The family was very well known. Over 1,000 people were in this crowd. After the funeral, other people had conducted the funeral. Tucker was standing there by the casket, looking down in the face of his wife, who he'd never get to speak to again on this earth. This is what he said. He said, the other day when I was here, a man told me I could not say Christ was sufficient if my wife were dead and if my children were crying for their mother. He said, if that man is here today, tell him that Christ is sufficient. He said, my heart is all broken. My heart is all crushed. My heart is all bleeding. But there's a song in my heart, and Christ put it there. I want you to tell that man that though my wife is gone and my children are motherless, Christ comforts me today. And guess what? That man was there. And he came down to the aisle, and he fell beside that casket, and he said, truly, if Christ can help us like this, then I will surrender to him. And the man was saved. So we hear a story like this, right? And there's this mix of emotions that happen in us. Here's Tucker and his wife there. They're telling people the gospel. They're sharing the good news with people. They're doing what they're supposed to be doing. And this tragedy strikes. It strikes their family. You know, it doesn't seem right. How could that happen? And then you're saddened by the loss that he must have suffered and his children suffered. But then there's also a part of us that's kind of filled with joy that in the midst of this tragedy, in the midst of this circumstance, Tucker could still say Christ is sufficient. And people could hear that and be saved. That seems to be the way of the world. That seems to be the world that we live in right here. Bad things happen to good people all the time. 
This is not unique to Tucker. This is not unique to, to his family or just a select few. It happens to all of us. And there's many of us in this room, as I look around, I know some of our stories, through no obvious fault of our own, we have suffered. We have suffered trials, tribulations. It's just the way that this world is, this sinful world. And scripture is full of examples like this. It's hard to just pick one example. There's so many examples in scripture, so many people that we could look at in scripture that were right where they were supposed to be, doing exactly what they were supposed to do, and yet they suffered trials and hardships and persecutions and sufferings. So I think of Joseph. Look at the life of Joseph. His brother sold him into slavery. He was wrongly imprisoned. The man didn't do anything wrong. What about Paul? He was sharing the gospel with people. He was stoned. He was beaten. He was put in prison. He was hated. What about Daniel? Daniel was right where he was supposed to be in Babylon, praying like he was supposed to to the Lord. He got cast in the lion's den. And what about, of course, the number one example, Jesus? Jesus, who only did good all the time, always, suffered more than any other man has ever suffered. But I've chosen today to look at the lives of three other men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in Daniel chapter 3. So if you have your Bibles, feel, feel free to open up there. Daniel chapter 3 is where we're going to be at. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, these names were actually Babylonian names given to these guys. These were not their given names. Their given names contain the names of God in, in some form or another, or they contain the covenant name in a shorter form of God's name, Yahweh. And so Nebuchadnezzar obviously wanted to change their names. So he gave them the names Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Their given names were Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. And that's how I'll be referring to them for that reason. So, but these men were taken captive at the same time all of God's people were taken captive. They were taken captive out of Jerusalem and brought to Babylon. And guess what? They were exactly where they were supposed to be, right in the middle of Babylon. They weren't where they weren't supposed to be. It was no accident that they were there. They were there where they were supposed to be. Here's what had happened. For centuries, God's people had been rejecting him, had been rebelling against him, had been practicing idolatry. God had been trying to get their attention for centuries, and they wouldn't listen. God who brought them out of Egypt, who brought them through the wilderness, who brought them into the promised land, who gave, a, gave them a land whose very presence was in their midst, they were rejecting him, they were turning from him, and they were practicing idolatry. So in an attempt, right, to cleanse them from their idolatry, to get their attention, to shake them awake, God sent King Nebuchadnezzar into Jerusalem to take the people captive, to destroy the town, to totally just cleanse everything. But God in his mercy and God in his compassion for his people gave the people a warning. Ahead of time, he gave his people a warning. He said, this is going to happen. This is what I'm going to do. I'm going to cleanse the land. I'm sending you out of here and I'm warning you ahead of time. This is coming. Be obedient to me. This, and he spoke through many of his prophets. He spoke through Jeremiah many times to his people, warning them, this is coming. I want you to leave. I want you to go to Babylon. And if you do that, you'll save your life. This is what he said through the prophet Jeremiah. This is what Jeremiah said to the people about this. He says, thus says the Lord, Behold, I set before you the way of life and the way of death. He who stays in this city shall die by the sword, by famine and by pestilence. But he who goes out and surrenders to Nebuchadnezzar or and the Babylonians who are besieging you shall live and shall have his life as a prize of war. For I have set my face against this city for harm and not for good, declares the Lord. It shall be given into the hand of the king of Babylon, and he shall burn it with fire. So God warns his people, punishment is coming. I'm going to cleanse you guys. But he warns them ahead of time. Just the, the gentleness and the mercy of God. So some, among some of the first ones taken were, uh, were Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. They were some of the first ones taken, along with Daniel. Now, apparently, these men loved the Lord. They were not practicing idolatry. They, they were following the Lord. They were faithful and committed to him, and yet they still got caught up in all of this. They were still to be taken to Babylon. And in obedience, they went. They were some of the first ones to leave, to be taken, to be kidnapped out of Israel and brought to Babylon. And while they were in Babylon, God gave them wisdom. He gave them understanding. He gave them skill and literature so that everyone recognized the skill and the wisdom that God had given them. And because of this, they were brought before the king 
regularly. They had access to the king. They were in the king's palace. They were preferred over others. So, and not only were they where they were supposed to be in Babylon, which might seem, seem strange, but they were right where they were supposed to be, they were also doing exactly what they were supposed to be doing. So here they are in Babylon, and their kidnapper, the great and powerful King Nebuchadnezzar, king over Babylon, builds this huge, you remember the story, he builds this huge idol. It's 90 feet tall. And then he, then he makes a proclamation and he says this to all the people in Babylon. He says, when you hear the music play, when you hear the worship music start, I want you to fall before this 90 foot tall golden idol that I've made. And those of you who won't will be killed. Not only will you be killed, you'll be cast into a fiery furnace. You will die. So his message basically was turn or burn. You know, we hear that a lot today. That was, that was the message of Nebuchadnezzar, turn or burn. You fall down and worship, or you're going to be cast into the fiery furnace. So what are these three young men going to do? How are they going to respond? They're where they're supposed to be, but now they're facing a challenge. Well, I think it's important to point out that this, this idol wasn't put up overnight. This thing, they didn't wake up in the morning, and there it was, right? I, I believe they probably watched this thing being built, and these were not stupid guys. They probably knew the pagan idolatrous land they were in. They knew this was going to be become an idol, an idol, a thing that they were to worship. And they had access to the king. They had access to his advisors. I'm sure they heard conversations over the whole time this was being constructed. Hey, we're going to worship this and everything. And so these were not dumb, naive guys. So I imagine, scripture doesn't say this, but I imagine what happened was they had probably gotten together ahead of time. They had decided in their hearts what they were going to do. And they decided that they were not going to bow to the idol. And when the time came, they did the right thing. When the time came, they did not bow to the idol, even in the face of death. And so the music plays. They don't bow down. Nebuchadnezzar ends up hearing about this, and he confronts them. And this is Nebuchadnezzar, what he said to them in verse 14 of chapter 3. Nebuchadnezzar answered and said to them, is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the golden image that I have set up? Now, if you are ready, when you hear the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music, to fall down and worship the image that I have made, well and good. But if you do not worship, you shall immediately be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. And who is the God that will deliver you out of my hands? We know this story, and we know that that God is about to reveal himself to Nebuchadnezzar. Verse 16, look at how Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego respond. One of the great responses in all of Scripture. Listen to what they say to, to King Nebuchadnezzar. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If this be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us, is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace. And he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. What strength. What, these are young men. What strength. What resolve to stand in front of the most powerful man in the word, world and tell him we will not bow to your idol. And I don't believe these were sarcastic words. They knew this man was powerful. They had a respect for authority. I believe these words were just matter of fact. This is where we stand and we will not budge. What resolve, what strength. They were standing for what was right. They were not about to worship anything other than the Lord, any person, any image other than the Lord. And so if we didn't know the story, if we didn't know how it ends, I think we would naturally tend to think, well, some, obviously something good's going to happen here, right? They're doing good. Something good's going to happen. Obviously, the fire's going to magically go out. They won't be put in the fire. Maybe King Nebuchadnezzar will drop dead. Maybe, maybe, just maybe, that idol, that idolatrous temple will fall over, and in the chaos, they'll forget all about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But as we know, and as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego found out, that's not what happened at all. They learned the important lesson that just because you're right where you're supposed to be and just because you're doing what you're supposed to be doing doesn't mean the bad things won't happen. 
does, it just doesn't. So after they make their stand, they refuse to bow to his idol, and Nebuchadnezzar just loses it, right? I would imagine no one had ever talked to him this way in his entire life. And so he loses it. Listen to what he tells them in, verses ni- in verse 19. He says this, Then Nebuchadnezzar was filled with fury, and the expression of his face was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He ordered the furnace heated seven times more than it was usually heated, and he ordered some of the mighty men of his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and to cast them into the burning, fiery furnace. Then these men were bound in their cloaks, their tunics, their hats, and their other garments, and they were thrown into the burning, fiery furnace. Because the king's order was urgent and the furnace overheated, the flame of the fire killed those men who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down into the burning, fiery furnace. So they're thrown into the fire. Here they are in Babylon, where they're supposed to be, doing what God wanted them to do, what he didn't want the other people to do, not practice idolatry in Jerusalem. They're not doing that. And yet they're still cast into the burning, fiery furnace. Have you ever been in this position? Have you ever been cast into the burning, fiery furnace? You feel like you're where you're supposed to be? You feel like you're doing what you're supposed to be doing, and yet tragedy hits your life. Many of you in this room know that me and my family suffered a tragedy in 2016. Um, We had been in Tennessee for three years, and everything seemed to be going well, right? I found a job pretty quickly, within a month of moving here, I believe. Um, We had just bought a house. We had bought our first house. We had just started going to fellowship. We were about to become members of fellowship. We had two healthy kids, my daughter, Ray J, and uh, our two-year-old, Noah. There's a picture of him there. And we were happy, right? We felt like we were right where we were supposed to be, and we felt like we were doing what it was that we were supposed to be doing. And on January 14th, a day that started out like any other day, it was one of those beautiful winter days in January where sometimes it gets warm. Sometimes it's warm in January. It was one of those days I was at work. I was driving a truck. I was down in Canton, Mississippi. I was almost where I was supposed to be going. And I got a phone call from Destiny that changed both of our lives forever. As soon as I picked up the phone and started talking to Destiny, I could hear the panic in her voice. And she told me that Noah was lost in the woods and no one could find him. And panic and fear gripped me and gripped my heart helplessness. I was four hours away. I was driving a truck that was governed at 65 miles an hour. So I turn around and I start heading back. Now the woods where everybody was, where no one was lost, there's no cell service. And so I didn't get any updates on the way back. If something would have happened, if they'd have found him, I, I would have got an update. I know it, but that was the longest four hours of my life driving back, pleading with God, begging God to help him to help us to find our son. I get to the house, it's now dark, and there's people everywhere, right? The sheriff is there, TBI is there, there's people searching on horses, there's helicopters flying overhead, there's lights, there's trailers, there's people all over the place, and I walk into this chaos, right? And we all spend that night searching for Noah all night through the woods, going through rivers and and streams and over hills, it just, all night. We spent all the next day and all the next night looking for him. We spent all the next day and all the next night looking for him. We did that for an entire week in the woods with tons of volunteers. And finally, on January 21st, we found him. And I will never forget that day. Sheriff Weaver called us into the kitchen, which he did quite regularly, so we just thought this was another one of our you know, regular meetings with the sheriff. He called us, and we were standing there in a circle, and and he says, we found Noah. Just for a moment, for a brief moment, I had this hope in my heart. I said, is he okay? Is he okay? And I just had this hope deep in my heart. I knew he wasn't okay. And Sheriff Weaver just, you know, sadly shook his head no. And we just all lost it. You know, all the emotions, all the tension, all the fear, all the everything of all the week just came crashing down on us. In that moment, we knew that it was all over, right? I mean, some of you were there during that time. 
Some of you were there with us. Some of you were searching the woods. Some of you guys were praying with us. And we are still grateful to this day for the way that God comforted us through many of you guys. That's what he did. He comforted us through you guys. So one thing that changed in our lives as a result, one way that that event changed us was that we were finally relieved of the belief that if you do good things, good things happen. That was a hard pill to swallow. We were right where we were supposed to be, doing what we were supposed to do. And guess what? Bad things happen. Tragedy struck. It happened. That was one thing that we learned. Another thing that we learned was that when you go through that fiery trial, when you are in the pain and the suffering and the misery, Jesus is right there with you. That was something we could have learned no other way. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego learned that too. Look at verse 24 back in our story. Then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished and rose up in haste. He declared to his counselors, did we not cast three men bound into the fire? They answered and said to the king, true, O king. He answered and said, but I see four men unbound walking in the midst of the fire and they are not hurt. And the appearance of the fourth is like a son of the gods. Then Nebuchadnezzar came near to the door of the burning, fiery furnace. He declared, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out and come here. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out from the fire. And the satraps, the prefects, the governors, and the king's counselors gathered together and saw that the fire had not any power over the bodies of those men. The hair of their heads was not singed. Their cloaks were not harmed. And no smell of fire had come upon them. So we see these men, where they're supposed to be, doing what they're supposed to do, cast into the fire anyway. But we also see that they were not alone. Jesus was there with them in their suffering. And I don't believe that there's any other way that we can know this, that Jesus is there with us in our suffering other than experiencing it. Think about this. How can you experience joy if there's no such thing as pain? You have nothing to compare it to. How can you be courageous and brave if such a thing as fear does not exist? And how can you learn that Christ is sufficient until you find out nothing else is, everything else is insufficient? And how can you find out that Christ is all you need until he's all that you have? When I was sitting in a prison cell all those years ago, I hope that doesn't come a shock to I've shared my testimony before, so the people who come here know, but some of you may not know. But anyways, when I was sitting in a prison cell all those years ago, I was there because I deserved to be there. I wasn't falsely accused. I was arrested because I was doing wrong. I deserved to be right there. I had broken the law. I was getting what I deserved. I was in the fiery furnace, but I had put myself there. Guess what? In that furnace, there with me. Jesus was there with me in a nasty, dark, cold prison cell. Jesus was with me. How much more will he be with his children who are where they are, doing what they're supposed to do, who walk in and suffer tragedy just because as a result of being in this sinful world? How much more? And the way that we handle that suffering the way that we handle that tragedy becomes an opportunity for us to witness to the world. And that's exactly what happened with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Look at verse 28. Nebuchadnezzar answered and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and delivered his servants, who trusted in him and set aside the king's command and yielded up their bodies rather than serve and worship any god except their own. Therefore, I make a decree. Any people, nation, or language that speaks anything against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be torn limb from limb and their houses laid in ruins. Interesting response there. For there is no other God who is able to rescue in this way. Nebuchadnezzar sees them live out what they say they believe at the cost of their own lives. And this is a powerful witness this is a powerful testimony to what they believe. 
we need to be careful. We need to understand. This, I'm, I'm going to say something really real to you right now, and I hope you understand this. When we pray and ask God to use us, this may be how he chooses to use you. This may be how he chooses to use us, through a fiery furnace. But our Father is good and kind and compassionate, and all that he does is perfect. And when we get to heaven, no matter what we've been through here, we will never say, Lord, you were wrong. We will only say, Lord, you were right. I wish I would have done so much more for you. That's what we're going to say. So during that time where we lost Noah, I know many lives were changed. The heartache, the pain, the suffering that, that me and my family and, and, and people went through, even in spite of all that, God's presence was there. Anyone who was there knows that. People were being saved. There were, there were people praying. There, were, there was kind of a, a little revival. People who hadn't prayed in years were doing that. We saw people get saved. And even to this day, we have friends now that we have made, we made at the time that we still have, that have gotten saved since then. Not because we're anything special, not because of us, but because God in his mercy and compassion and grace brought beauty out of the ashes. God spoke to them through this thing. And so people who know God and have spent time with him and learned that he is trustworthy and faithful, even when bad things happen that they don't understand, they find a way, they know he's trustworthy and they can trust in them, trust in him. And that becomes a witness to the world. Not because that person, sorry, not because that person is anything special. Not because that person is super strong but because he's never let us walk alone and he is sufficient and he walks with us through the fire and he gives us what we need right when we need it. Have you guys heard of Corey Ten Boom? Do you know who she is? So if you don't know who she was, she was a Dutch woman and um, she, her father was a watchmaker and she was alive during the time of World War II during the Holocaust. And so her and her family, they were Christian believers, but they would hide Jews trying, trying to escape the Holocaust, trying to escape the concentration camps. They would hide them in, her, in their house. Eventually, they were caught, and she was sent to a concentration camp. But anyways, she wrote a book called The Hiding Place about her experiences during that whole time. And there's this one conversation in there. Um, it, she's writing about the time when she was a child, and she's having a difficult time She's realized that one day her dad's gonna die. And one day she's not gonna be with him. And they have this conversation. This is what she says. She bursts into tears in the book. Corey bursts into tears. She says, I need you. You can't die, you can't. This is what her father says. Corey, he began gently. When you and I go to Amsterdam, when do I give you your ticket? Why, just before we get on the train, she said. Exactly. And our wise father in heaven knows when we're going to need things too. Don't run out ahead of him, Corey. When the time comes that some of us will have to die, you will look into your hearts and find the strength you need just in time. And that's true. For any of us who have been through something like that, we know. Looking back, we don't know how we got through it. Looking ahead, we don't know how we could ever go through something like that. But God doesn't give us what we need until we need it. He is sufficient he is able. Trust yourself to the Lord. Suffering and trials and pain comes to everybody. But for the people of God, he's going to always give us what we need. I'd like to end with this. There was another, another woman who knew something about suffering. Her name was Annie J. Flint. Now, she was born, her parents, uh, she was born in the 1800s. Her parents died very, very young. And so she had some adopted parents who also died when she was young. Then, when she was also very young, arthritis started setting into her body. And pretty soon, she was wheelchair-bound. She lived the rest of her life into her 60s in pain with her hands being twisted, pain all the time in a wheelchair. And yet, she was a Christian. She believed in the Lord. And she wrote this, she wrote this poem called, He Giveth More Grace. This is what it says. He giveth more grace when the burdens grow greater. He sendeth more strength when the labors increase. To added afflictions, he addeth his mercy. To multiplied trials, his multiplied peace. When we have exhausted our store of endurance, 
when our strength has failed or the day is half done, when we've reached the end of our hoarded resources, our Father's full giving is only begun. His love has no limits, His grace has no measure, His power no boundary known unto men. For out of His infinite riches in Jesus, He giveth and giveth and giveth again. Those are true words. Can I encourage you and tell you that Christ is sufficient? Anyone who has been through a trial, anyone who has been through a tragedy and lean on Jesus, you know what I'm talking about. Will you pray with me? Lord, we thank you for what we just read, Lord. You are sufficient. We know the pain and the suffering and the tragedy we experience in this world as a result of our very own sin. Yet you are compassionate. You've warned us in your word this is what we're facing. You told us to run to you and find you sufficient. You help us to do that. Lord, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you for your compassion. Thank you that you giveth and giveth and giveth again, Lord. Father, I pray for anybody in here now who might be going through a tragedy, a trial, or a struggle, Lord, that you would comfort them, you would put your arm around them like only you can, Lord. They would know that you are the only thing that they need. Thank you, Lord. Thank you that you are sufficient. In Jesus